Hi, everybody. So in this video, we're going to delve deeper into this question, why study philosophy? In the previous video, when we looked at an intro to philosophy, hopefully you got a sense for why what we do is sort of important. Okay, so what is it again that we do? Well, remember the term philosophy can be generally thought of as just the love of wisdom, you know, wanting to be close to it, wanting to, to hang out with it, right? Having this intimacy with wisdom. And if we were to ask, well, what's the heart of what that means? Did you notice, based upon our last lecture, what the answer might be? Really, at the heart of what we do is we simply ask questions. We try not to take things for granted. So if we take a look at the major branches of philosophy to give ourselves some idea of what uh, is studied in philosophy, they're all about asking different sorts of questions. And in our class, we're going to be focused on three major branches of philosophy. So first, uh, we'll talk a lot about metaphysics. And this is the branch that asks questions about, well, what's reality? What's the nature of reality? We'll also look into something referred to as epistemology. Epistemology asks questions about knowledge. What can you know? How do you know it? What's the nature of what it means for something to be true? Right? That's epistemology. And the third major branch that we'll touch upon towards the end of our course is ethics. And ethics looks at questions about morality. It looks at questions about what the right and wrong thing to do is. In addition to these, there are other branches of philosophy that we won't really have a chance to look through in our introductory course. Things like aesthetics, which asks questions about beauty and the branch of uh, logic, which looks at questions about the quality of an argument, how to technically analyze them. And we'll do that, of course, in our class too, but we won't delve so deeply into the nitty gritty and technical aspects of analyzing arguments per se. There is the philosophy of religion, where we ask questions about, you know, what's the nature of religious belief? What's the uh, questions about what God is like, who God is? Now, in our class, we'll touch a little bit about that. Um, but in the context of ethics and in the context of metaphysics, especially when we take a look at Eastern philosophy, there's also social and political philosophy. And as the term implies, it's about, you know, questions of how to live best with other people, how to live in societies. Okay, so lots of different branches of philosophy, and they all ask different sorts of questions. Now, you've been philosophers all your life because you've probably asked your parents questions about why this is true, why do you have to do that. You've probably been philosophers anytime you question your teacher or question any sort of authority figure, you know. Why do you have to do that for an assignment? What's the point of this? You're also philosophers when you did your Flipgrid reflection for this week, all right, where I had you answer these three questions. Who are you? Why are you in this class? And how would you fill in the blank to this statement? Life is all about what? Hopefully, you've had a chance to take a look at some of your classmates' responses. Normally, in our live classes, you know, I'd break you guys up into groups, and I'd have you share your responses and try to see if there are any commonalities, any, any sorts of responses that are kind of similar amongst people in your group. Did you notice that at all when you were looking at your fellow classmates' responses? Did you notice any common ways of answering questions or did anybody have any really interesting responses from what you saw? Let's think about that for a second. When we take a look at these questions, how did people answer them? When people answered the question, who are you? Did anybody say, you know, I am a human. I am uh, a conscious being. I am, and they just listed their name. I am John. I am James. Or maybe their ethnicity, I am an Asian American, I am, or maybe they talked about their parents, I am the son of, I am the daughter of. Can you think of other ways people in your class answered this question? How about why are you in this class? What sorts of answers did you see? Did anybody say things like, yeah, I am in this class to learn something new. I am in this class because I'm curious about life. I'm in this class because... 
Um, it fit my schedule. I mean, let's be brutally honest. How many of you, even if you didn't write it, thought to yourself, well, I'm in this class because I need the credits. <laughs> I need, I'm in this class because, because I need the units to graduate. I mean, even if you didn't write that down, how many of you, if you really looked at why you're in this class, that's kind of the reason. I mean, I hope that's not the only reason, but for a lot of students, that often is the reason, which kind of leads to the third question. How did you fill in this blank? How did your fellow classmates fill, fill in this blank? Did they say life is all about um, joy? Did they say life is all about asking questions? Did they say life is all about having fun? Did anybody say life is all about existing? <laughs> Think about all the choices and decisions you make. In particular, why are you in this class? They all, whatever answer you give will tell you what you think life is about, won't it? I mean, why, if you think about why you're in this class, ask yourself the question, okay, if I'm here because it fits my schedule and I get GE credits, well, why do I care if it fits my schedule and gives me GE credits? I mean, what's the point of that? You might say, because I need it to graduate. Well, why do you care about graduating? You might say, because I want a better job than I have now. I want a better opportunity. Why do you want a better job? Why do you want better opportunity? What do better opportunities even mean to you? Where is that supposed to get you? Do you see how why we think we do something is probably a deeper question than we at first realize? Because every choice you make, as we talked about before, how you use your time, in particular taking this class or any other class, the goals you have, they all tell you, I mean, even if you're not conscious of it, what you think life is about. So does your answer for number three fit or match what you said for number two at all? So this approach to philosophy, this whole idea of asking questions, getting to the heart of wisdom. I mean, in Western philosophy, we often say it, this all stems from a particular philosopher, Socrates. And it's, it's um, Socrates that you sort of read about for today, right? And I say sort of because, you know, when we take a look at who Socrates is, he's often thought of as the, you know, father of Western philosophy because of the very fact that he asks lots of questions. But here are some things you should take note of. Number one, Socrates never really wrote anything. I mean, notice what you read for today's class. You read an excerpt from Plato's work, right? The defense of Socrates from the Apology, written by the philosopher Plato. Socrates never wrote anything. Plato, one of Socrates' students, is where we know most or how we know most about Socrates. So that's note number three, right? Note number one, Socrates didn't really write anything. What we know about Socrates really mostly comes from Plato, his student. And the way we come to know Socrates is when Plato writes, notice that Plato is writing through the voice of Socrates, Right? So everything that you read for today, you know, if we take a look at page 15 in your textbook, there are many reasons why I'm not grieved, O men of Athens, at the vote of condemnation. I expect it and am only surprised that the voters are so nearly equal. I mean, this is Socrates speaking, but it's written by Plato. So a lot of what we know, or most of what we know about Socrates comes from Plato. And number three, Socrates never claimed to be teaching. <laughs> Socrates basically went around asking questions. So let's backtrack. Let's get a fuller picture of this philosopher that we know through Plato, this Socrates character. There is a story that says Socrates' friend, Cherifin, goes to visit an oracle. Now, if you're not familiar with what an oracle is, think of an oracle as somebody that you go to to find the truth, right? You know, uh, generals would go and consult with the oracle to find the truth in which they can get information to get ready for, you know, the next great battle. So Cherifin goes into this cave and finds the oracle and asks the oracle a question about his friend Socrates. Is anybody wiser than this guy? Is anybody wiser than my friend Socrates? 
And the Oracle says, no, there is no one wiser than Socrates. So Cherifin goes, goes back, tells his friend Socrates, hey, buddy, guess what? The Oracle says there is no one wiser than you. Well, think about how you'd respond if you were Socrates. What would your response be? If, if you're a wise person like Socrates, would you go, yes, I know that is true. There is nobody wiser than me. What would you do? What would your response be? Would your response be, oh, please. The Oracle doesn't know what she's talking about. Well, think about that phrase or that sentence. There is no one wiser than you. There is no one wiser than Socrates. What does that even mean? It actually could mean lots of things, right? It could mean we're all equally wise, in which case there's no one wiser than me. It could mean we are all equally stupid, in which case there's nobody wiser than me. Or it could mean there's no such thing as wisdom, or it could mean I am really wise and everybody else is below me, right? It's not automatically that last interpretation. So being the wise individual that he is, Socrates went about trying to find out what the oracle meant by asking questions. So if you wanted to find out how wise other people are, you know, you'd ask them why they believe something. You see somebody growing something, you go, wait, why are you putting that much water there? Why are you putting um, uh, that plant next to this plant? If you see a, a person that works the city, you might ask them, well, why do we do this in the city? Why do we do that? What's the, what's the reason for this? And he would do that. Ask questions. Poke. Prod people. Now, what happens over time when you eventually ask lots of questions of people? you may start to notice that people don't know as much as you might think. That if you really poke and ask, why? 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 No, why? Why do you believe this? No, no, why do you believe that? Why are you signed up for this class? Because you want, you want the credits? Well, why do you want the credits? Because you want the degree? Why do you want the degree? Because you want a good job? Why do you want the good job? Because you want money? Why do you want money? Because it'll make me happy? If you poke and poke and poke and poke, sometimes people don't even know why they do anything, why they believe something. As a result of him continually asking questions, what you read about for today in the text was how Socrates was eventually put on trial as being a corrupter of the youth by asking so many questions. One way to think about what happened is if you ask a lot of questions, especially of people in power, they get kind of scared. They get kind of irritated. They get kind of mad. Well, in Athens, it's, it was a democracy. So if you ask people questions, the people in power are everybody. And they all got mad at Socrates for questioning them. Right? And this is what you read about for today. You read about Socrates' response to being put on trial for quote unquote corrupting the youth. In other words, for asking questions. Some people might say too many questions. One thing to take note of is that when Sheriffin actually went to the Oracle, there was a sign over the entrance to the Oracle and the sign read, know thyself. You might want to think about the sorts of questions that would imply are important to life. But I digress. Let's move on. So why study philosophy? Well, let's take a look at Socrates. On the last page of a reading, page 17, uh, he says, And what a life should I lead at my age, wandering from city to city, ever changing my place of exile, and always being driven out? Right? So, you know, if you're on trial. Why not just go some other place, right? Why not just go some other place, escape Athens, you know, let's, let's sneak you out, Socrates, and you could live your life. And Socrates says, and what life should I lead at my age, wandering from city to city, ever changing my place of exile, and always being driven out? For I am quite sure that wherever I go, there as here, the young men will flock to me, and I drive them away, their elders will drive me out at their request. And, okay, I'm sorry, and if I drive them away, their elders will drive me out at their request. And if I let them come, 
their fathers and friends will drive me out at their sakes. So he's saying, look, if I go to another place, it won't be any good because I'll be asking a lot of questions. People want to come to me to learn because I ask a lot of questions. I am apparently wise. It, I, it's going to be the same result. Someone will say, yes, Socrates, but cannot you hold your tongue? In other words, can't you just stop asking questions? Right? Why don't you stop asking questions? Go live your life. Go be with your family. Just stop asking questions and you'll be fine. You, you can escape and you won't. Because the punishment here, if he's convicted of corrupting the youth, and the punishment is death. Right? Let's ask us of yourselves. How many of you, if I said, look, uh, we're going to kill you. But if you just stop asking questions, you can live. How many of you would go, um, no, I'm going to continue asking questions. You know, if you're a reasonable person, you'd probably say, okay, I'll stop asking questions. I don't want to die. But what does Socrates say? When responding to that question, why not just stop asking questions? Why not just be free? What does he say? All right? Towards the middle of the paragraph, for if I tell you that to do as you say would be a disobedience to the God, and therefore that I, when he says that, by the way, he's saying uh, that it would, it which wouldn't be right, right? For if I tell you that to do as you say would be a disobedience to, you know, the ultimate you know, what's ultimately right, and therefore that I cannot hold my tongue, I can't stop asking questions, you will not believe that I'm serious. And if I say again that daily to discourse, if I, and if I say again that daily to discourse about virtue and of those other things about which you hear me examining myself and others is the greatest good of man, right? In other words, that what he's doing, what he's asking, the, the, the whole idea of asking questions, the questions he's asking, who he's questioning to, who he's questioning. He's saying, if you, you know, I'm telling you that this is, this is of good, this is of great importance to people. You're not going to believe me, right? And the key here that I want you to underline, I want you to take notes of, re, re, highlight, whatever you need to do, is this next section. And that the unexamined life is not worth living, you are still less likely to believe me. So what's his answer? Why not just stop asking questions and be free? He says, because asking questions is for the good of man. That asking questions, especially the questions I'm asking, are of great importance. And because the unexamined life is not worth living. Highlight, underline, box, put a star. Because the unexamined life is not worth living. Now, what does that even mean? The unexamined life is not worth it. Why would he say that? Why would he say it's worth dying? Right? Because the unexamined life is not worth living. To get a better sense for why this is so important, let's take a look at the other reading for today. Right? The reading from Zhuang Zi, Chinese philosopher, like we talked about earlier, and associated with Taoism as a contemporary of Plato around the same time period. And here we have a student of Zhuangzi, you know, wanting some verification of a, a belief they have, right? Wanting somebody to go, ha, you are right about that, right? Do we know people like this who want somebody to go, you're right about that, who are more concerned about being right than they are of being compassion, compassionate or kind? Do we know people like this? Have you ever felt this way in an argument where you just want to be right and that's more important than anything else? Well, here's a student within the reading that comes to Zhuang Zi and goes, hey, look, I want verification. I'm right about something. And what is Zhuang Zi's response? How does Zhuang Zi respond? Let's read the whole thing from page 18. You are going too fast. You see your egg and expect to hear it crow. You look at your crowbow, uh, crowbow, crossbow, <laughs> crowbow. You look at your crow. Crowbow, <laughs> you look at your crossbow and expect to have broiled duck before you. I will say a few words to you at random. And do you listen at random? 
Do you see how he's responding to the student so far? How does the sage seat himself by the sun and moon and hold the universe in its grasp? He blends everything into one harmonious whole, rejecting the confusion of this and that rank and precedence, which the vulgar prize, the sage stolidly, uh, stolidly ignores. The revolutions of 10,000 years leave his unity unscathed. The universe itself may pass away, but he will flourish still. Those who dream of the banquet wake to lamentations and sorrow. Those who dream of lamentation and sorrow wake to join the hunt. While they dream, they do not know that they dream. Some will even interpret the very dream they are dreaming. And only when they awake do they know it was a dream. By and by comes the great awakening. And then we find out that this life is really a great dream. Fools think they are awake now and flatter themselves, and they know if they are really princes or peasants. Confucius and you are both dreams. And I say, and I who say you are dreams, I am but a dream myself. This is a paradox. Tomorrow a sage may arise to explain it, but that tomorrow will not be until... 10,000 generations have gone by. What's he talking about here? There will come a great awakening, and only then shall we know the great dream that all this is. Yet the ignorant are sure they are awake, sure as sure can be. This one's a ruler, that one's a shepherd. They're absolutely certain of it. Is he talking literally about being asleep? Is he literally talking about some great dream we are all in? In what ways is this true of us? In what ways are we sort of in the great dream? And how might this be related to the whole idea that Socrates poses that it's really important to ask questions? Well, think about the whole idea of being awake, right? The whole idea of awakeness refers to consciousness, that we're conscious of life. We're conscious of you know, what we go through in life. Zhuang Zi here is saying that, well, no, not really. Most of us are not conscious of life. We're not conscious of being alive. Does that even make sense to you? Can you relate that at all to anything? Well, let's think about psychology for a second. Freud, have you heard of Freud, was famous because he popularized the notion of the unconscious. Now, what does that mean? It means that Freud posited this theory that a lot of our behavior is the result of unconscious processes. So here we are making choices and decisions, and Freud says, I know you think you're consciously making those choices and decisions, but really at the root of your choice and decision is an unconscious force that's kind of propelling you to make that choice and decision. Let's think about that for a second. Let's think about a simple, basic choice, like what you're going to wear today. So you looked at your closet, you picked out some clothing. Why did you want to wear that? I mean, the, the, the answer, if you're saying you made the conscious choice, is because you wanted to. Like, I, I wanted to wear this. Or I wanted to feel comfortable, right? Or it's like the only clean thing I had. Well, let's take a look at those answers. You wanted to wear it? Why did you want to wear it? You wanted to be comfortable? Why do you want to be comfortable? It's the only clean thing you had. Why did you want to only wear clean clothes? Underlying all of those, says Freud, are unconscious forces. Forces that dictated our preference. Maybe because of how we grew up in the past, we have a preference for a certain color. Maybe because of what we're exposed to within our culture, we have a preference for a certain style. Why do you want to feel comfortable? Well, biologically, maybe, you know, we're we're, we have a predisposition to feel comfortable, to want to feel comfortable, to desire to feel comfortable. We didn't choose that. I mean, what comfortable feels like is based upon our biology, isn't it? So this is kind of what Freud is getting at, that a lot of our choices are the result of unconscious forces. If you've taken a basic psychology class, you basically, you've probably learned about different conditioning right? Classical conditioning, the whole idea of Pavlov's dog, where we can train animals to have certain responses to stimuli that they didn't have natural responses to before. So for instance, if you walk by a restaurant and smell good food, you're naturally going to salivate, right? 
if you're walking through a kitchen or a restaurant or by a restaurant or you go to a family member's house and it smells really good, like the food smells, you're naturally going to salivate. That's programmed into you, right? That's an unconscious um, force acting upon you. But not only that, it turns out that if we, we can associate something with that experience, we can train you to have responses. So if every time you walk by a tasty restaurant, somebody said, um, hey, buddy, <laughs> okay? So let's say you always bring your wife or your husband or your boyfriend or girlfriend everywhere you go, and they're, they're going to play a real cruel joke with you. So every time you go through a, a, a pass by a restaurant, they're going to say, hey, buddy. And you're like, hey, buddy. Why do they keep saying, hey, buddy, every time you pass by a restaurant? Well, every time you pass by the restaurant, they say, hey, buddy, and then you start to salivate because you salivate when you smell good food. Hey, buddy, you salivate when you smell the good food. Hey, buddy, you salivate when you smell the good food. Eventually, classical conditioning shows you're going to start to salivate when somebody says, hey, buddy. That's weird. That's really strange. And all of a sudden, you're going to have this response, this behavior that's programmed into you. Now, think about childhood experiences. You may have had childhood experiences in the past. Where, you know, um, uh, a bully would always blow into your eye and say your name. You know, silly Sarah, whew, silly John, because they're just being silly and stupid. But then you grow up and then people say your name and you blink all of a sudden for no reason. Well, you might not know where that comes from. You might not be aware of why you blink. But it turns out it's because of classical conditioning. It's because of what happened to you in your past. Think about... Um, think about commercials and how they work and how we're, we're attracted to certain commercials. Well, a lot of that is classical conditioning or how we're attracted to certain products. I mean, a lot of that's classical conditioning where in the commercial, they show you something that you have a natural reaction to, a natural positive reaction to, and then that is paired with their product. So, you know, a stereotypical example is any sort of commercial aimed towards guys where there are like sexy women involved. Take the Axe body spray commercial, right? If you don't know Axe body spray commercials, go look it up on YouTube. They'll always have these guys spraying themselves with Axe body spray and then a flocks of beautiful women, scantily clad women, go towards them. Okay, well, what's happening there? Well, the scantily clad women are going to cause a biological response to heterosexual males that are watching the commercial, right? So heterosexual males will watch the commercial and they get excited. They feel good. Because they see these women who, you know, they're naturally biologically programmed to get excited about. But what else do they see? They see the Axe body spray, right? And then over time, enough men become conditioned to, you know, get positive feelings and get excited when they think of bo uh, Axe body spray that they go buy the product. So we think about any sort of product preference. Chances are they, it might, your preference might be the result of classical conditioning unconscious forces acting upon you. Same thing is true of operant conditioning. Operant conditioning, you can just think about in terms of reward and punishment. I mean, anytime a teacher said, good job, gave you a good grade, anytime a parent, you know, gave you a reward, patted you on the back, said something nice to you, there are reinforcing a certain type of behavior. You do your homework, right? And they give you, you know, uh, a certain amount of time playing video games. Uh, a teacher will give you an A, uh, or a good grade as a reinforcer for you turning in homework on time. And as a result of these positive reinforces, certain behaviors get programmed into us. Hopefully studying, hopefully turning your papers in on time, maybe doing your homework. Uh, the, the, the law does this, right? Where they punish you if you break the law, right? You get a ticket, you get a citation, you get a fine. And those are reinforcers for doing different types of behaviors. If you take a look at a lot of your behaviors, I bet you, you can trace them back to how you grew up. You trace them back to punishment and positive reinforcers, where somebody along the line said, you look good in that outfit, right? If enough people do that, give you a positive reinforcer for wearing that outfit, guess what? You're going to start to like that fashion. Think about a lot of the things you do. Can you see how they're the result of past experiences? Just think about habits too. Think about this morning. I'm going to assume you took a shower. I'm not going to judge you if you didn't. 
But if you took your shower, how many of you actually consciously chose which body part to wash first? I'm going to wash my left toe first today. Chances are you just went in and you just did it. You just took your shower like normal. Wasn't even thinking about which body part to wash first. You just did it. Right? Let's assume you brushed your teeth today. Again, I'm not going to judge if you did it. How many of you consciously chose which tooth to brush first? I'm going to brush my right molar first today. Chances are you didn't do that. You just brush your teeth like you always do. You didn't even think about which one to do first. Think about a lot of what you do. Isn't a lot of what you do based upon habit? Didn't you do a lot of things today without consciously choosing to do them? But just because it felt good or just because it was what you always do? So the whole idea Freud is bringing up is a lot of our choices are unconscious. We do a lot of things without thinking about them because of past experience, because of habit. Can you relate this now to Zhuang Zi and how we might be living in a great dream? How we might be living unconsciously? How we may not really be awake? Can you relate this to why this might be meaningful? When asked, why not, Socrates, just live your life, just stop asking questions, and you can live, not die. Socrates says no, because the unexamined life is not worth living. Because think about all, think about all these behaviors that we have unconsciously, that we do unconsciously. Think about all your beliefs that, that you may have because of unconscious forces, and not because you examine your life and ask questions about them. What does that make you? if you don't ask questions about where your beliefs come from? What does that make you if you don't ask questions about where your behaviors come from? Why you chose to do certain things? Think about these three questions. Who are you? Why are you in this class? What do you think life is all about? Where did you come up with the idea that you are your name? Where did you come up with the idea that you are a human? How much thought did you place into that belief? Or did you just believe it because that's what you believe? Why do you care about GE so much? Where does that come from? Why, why, why is the, the importance of a degree or a job or money? Where does that come from? You might say, oh, no, it comes from life. Come on. It's like obvious. Really? Is it really obvious? Have you thought carefully about that? Have you examined that belief? Because here's the question, if you don't ask questions about your beliefs, think back to Freud, if you don't consciously choose what to believe and what to do, what are you? What is an example of something that doesn't choose what to believe, right? That's just programmed by culture, by parents, by society, to believe certain things, to believe that you are your name, to believe that you need a good job to be, to have a good life, to believe that you should even have a good life in the first place. I mean, what sorts of things don't ask questions about that? Well, I mean, that's basically everything that's inanimate. Computers don't ask questions about that, right? They're programmed to spit those out. Your table don't, doesn't ask questions about that, right? I mean, the sh your shirt you're wearing doesn't ask questions about that. What's the difference between your shirt and your table and your computer and who you think you are? I mean, seemingly to ask questions about life, to be aware of why we do things and why, why we believe certain things, to be aware of that, Seemingly, that's what it means to be alive in many respects, right? Because if you're not asking questions, aren't you no different than a robot? Aren't you no different than a computer? That's just programmed. While a computer might be programmed by a software engineer, maybe you're just programmed by your culture, by your family. And then would you really be alive if you just took that programming for granted and just did everything that you're programmed to do? Can you see why... 
this was so important to Socrates. The unexamined life is not worth living, maybe, because you wouldn't really be alive if you didn't examine it.